The Lord calls us today to be the people of justice and mercy. The Lord asks that our words of hope become actions of peace. Let our ministry together bring peace and justice. Let us pray. Dear God, we invite your presence today for today's worship, and we thank you for everyone who came to be a part of your church today, and those who may be listening and watching the video later. God, bless them as they hear your word. I lift up Amy to you as she delivers your word, and give you thanks for the work you've done in her life and and throughout this week of preparation such a time as this that she is delivering the message god also think about the youth today as they may be out in a boat somewhere and hearing your word as well i pray that they would be touched and they would grow stronger in you in discipleship god your presence was known to them this weekend through joy and laughter. I thank you for that. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. children, I invite you to come on up for children's message. Hi guys. How are you? How are you? Good. Good. 
Everyone doing good today? Yeah, you happy to be here? Yeah. So today I'm going to talk about sacrifices in the Bible. Can anyone tell us what the word might mean? You know? Um, of killing yourself to survive other people. That, that was one of the ways that they that we do that. We could think of like the army people or, right? They're sacrificing their lives to protect us. Yep. Anybody else? Well, in the Old Testament, we hear a lot about this word sacrifices and how they did burnt offerings or grain offerings as a way that they made before God. And they were, they were laws that were made by God, you know, that, that made these sacrifices, that people made these sacrifices for their sins. They did something wrong, so they went to the temple and they, they offered up their cow or their, their, their animal as something that they gave over to God, you know, something that was valuable to them, and they offered it up to God. They also did it for peace offerings, and they did it in cel celebratory times. And so this was a big deal back then, uh, sacrifices. And it was a way that they could express their devotion to God, their love for God, and a way that they could be cleansed from their sins. So today we're going to hear from the book of Isaiah, and who was a prophet, and he tells his people how God is so displeased with their sacrifices. He says... And 113, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. Sounds like God's pretty mad here, right? But why would he be mad with someone's offerings? I mean, he told them to bring their offerings, but why would he be mad? What do you think? Because he would have to sacrifice himself because that was the only way to keep the people safe. Well, um, we see that God, God is upset with the people's offerings because maybe they're not doing it with their heart. Yeah? The whole point of having the sacrificial laws and, and saying, telling the people when you do something wrong to go make a sacrifice was so that they got back in right relationship with God. They were cleansed by God. But really, they weren't, they weren't being cleansed. They didn't have the heart for God. They were just basically saying sorry, but they didn't, they didn't change their behavior or their ways. So, that's right, yeah. We don't like that, do we? No. So God loved the people and was and is pleased with the hearts of the people. God wanted the people to change their ways and to love God, and therefore making a sacrifice would show them that they were willing to do that. So just like Isaac said, can you think of a time when you had said you were sorry, but perhaps you really didn't mean it, or someone told you they were sorry, and they really didn't mean it? How does that feel? Sad, right? Why do you feel sad? Because, like, if they say sorry and they don't mean it, it's like not saying sorry. Yeah. So this was this was exactly how God was feeling. They were the people were making sacrifices, and really they weren't they weren't doing it with their heart. It was meaningless, right? It's just a word. It doesn't doesn't it doesn't really change their behavior. Okay, are we ready to pray? All right. Let's close our eyes. Dear God, thank you for loving us, even when we do wrong things. Help us to remember you care about our actions of our hearts. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.
Good job, guys. Please let us stand for the reading of the scripture. Today I'll be reading Isaiah, first chapter, verses 1 and verses 10 through 20. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which was concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Tramp my courts no more. Bring offerings is bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of wearing them, bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. They shall are red like crimson. They shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the Lord, the mouth of the Lord has been spoken. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. I like that call and response. Makes me know that you guys are awake. Yeah, thanks, Lorraine, for reading that. And I mean, I don't even know if I have to preach because Sydney pretty much covered all of my points in your children's sermon. But before we really dive into Isaiah, I think it's important for us to know what kind of text we're reading. So this is something that we do in our everyday lives. You probably don't even know that you're doing it, but you are deciding what kind of genre the text is that you're reading before you go into it and glean whatever it is you're trying to get from it. So a good example of this is a very popular fiction series, Harry Potter, right? Okay, so you're reading Harry Potter, you know it's a narrative, you know it's a fictional narrative. But say I tell you that it's in fact a historical textbook. It is the history of maybe England, right? Because Harry Potter's in England. So you might get some really strange ideas about the history of England if you think Harry Potter is a history textbook. You might think there are wands, magical wands, invisibility cloaks, a history of magical battles, you know, Quidditch being the national sport. I really like Harry Potter, so I could keep going, but I'm not going to. Uh, so you would get some really false assumptions if you read Harry Potter thinking it's something else. And I think it's something that we need to know when we're reading the book of Isaiah, what kind of book this is. So Isaiah is a prophetic book, right? And when you hear prophecy now, 
you might think of someone hunched over a crystal ball or like maybe one of those groups that is sure they have the end of the world dialed down to the exact day and it's obviously coming soon and on an even number or maybe even a horoscope, right? But that is not what the prophetic genre in the Bible is. So the prophetic Bible's genre is not about future telling as much as it is about giving a word to the people for that particular time. So the prophetic genre has a prophet, so in this case Isaiah, that gets a word from God and then is tasked to share that word, be the mouthpiece of God to the particular people that they're talking to. And that word is timely for their particular moment. So there are, you know, exceptions to this rule. There are points in Isaiah where you might say, yes, this is talking about Jesus. And that happens, but that is not the main point of the book. That's far and in between in the book of Isaiah. Most of the time, it's for the people hearing it just then. We can see Isaiah really leaning into this, saying that he is sharing the word of, the God, of God to these people in verse 10 when he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And as Sidney said, they were tasked by law. Earlier in the Bible, we see it in Numbers and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. They were tasked with giving these sacrifices. But we also see in these verses that God says these sacrifices are an abomination. Stop doing it. Don't bring your solemn assemblies here. The solemn assemblies, by the way, were also, you know, in the law. They were told to do this. So why is God not happy? They seem to be doing what they were told, right? They're following the rules. What's going on? So I think we can figure this out if we look at some little details in this text. So first, in verse 10, we see Isaiah calling these people Sodom and Gomorrah. But in the first verse that we're in read, we know that he's talking to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Why is he calling them the wrong name? Why is he calling them Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah are basically cities from earlier in Genesis. They're basically like almost the origins of Israel. It would be in their past. But Sodom and Gomorrah are the evilest of all of the evil cities like Sin City times a thousand, times a billion. They have the distinct honor of getting destroyed by fire from heaven because they were just so evil. So whenever Isaiah says, you're Sodom and Gomorrah, they're like, oh crap, what did we do? How did we, you know, get to be the most evil city ever, right? They would probably be a little bit offended by this. They would be like, oh, I'm awake, I'm listening, and I'm kind of angry, right? We're not that evil, right? We're not Sodom and Gomorrah evil. We're doing our sacrifices. But God doesn't think they are doing well. He's calling them evil here. So maybe if we check out what they're doing and what they're not doing, we can get a clue. So some of the things that they are doing, they're offering a multitude of sacrifices, right? They're offering incense. They're observing religious festivals and Sabbath. They're offering prayer. God commanded them to do all of these things, right? Okay, maybe, maybe what they're not doing could be the key, right? They're not seeking justice. They are not rescuing the oppressed. They're not defending the orphan. And they're not pleading for the widow. So an observation I want to make about these two categories, the things that they are doing and the things that they aren't doing. The things that they are doing are religious ceremonies. They're religious actions. And the things that they are not doing are moral actions. They're about their heart and what is coming out of their heart, right? It's not just checking the box. So is it what they're doing or what they're not doing? So I think verse 16 give some direct instructions that might clear this up for us. Verse 16, 16 says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Okay, maybe that doesn't clear it up, but 
I looked into the biblical Hebrew for this, and it did clear it up a little bit. So in Hebrew, there are two words for clean, of making yourself clean. One of the words is sort of like a, you have dirt under your nails, you've been playing in a mud puddle, like go wash your hands, take a shower, or you're coming in a ritual state of uncleanliness to offer your sacrifices, right? So it's a very physical kind of clean. The other word for clean is a moral kind of clean, almost like an uprightness, right? And the word here that's being used in verse 16 is the word for moral cleanliness. So these people are bringing their sacrifices properly, but they are not morally clean. So I think this points to maybe what they're not doing is the problem, right? The sacrifices seem to be okay, but they're not living out a lifestyle that's watching out for the oppressed, for the orphan, and the widow. So I want to pause for a second here and nerd out a little bit with you guys and talk about there's this literary trope in the Old Testament where they talk about the alien, the orphan, and the widow. So here it's the oppressed, the orphan, and the widow, but it has the same sort of mean to it in the scripture. It's going to come across the same way to the Israelites when they read it. And basically what this means is it's the communities that are the most vulnerable. It's the people that don't have anyone to help them. It's the people that need the most assistance, right? Aliens, orphans, and widows. So this, even, even to the Judas, Ju- Judeans that heard this, They wouldn't be thinking exactly the oppressed, the orphan, and the widow. They would know that this meant the vulnerable among them, right? And we can see that we have vulnerable among us, right? And we can take that alien, orphan, and widow language and think, okay, maybe this is talking about people experiencing homelessness. Or maybe this is talking about someone in the foster care system. So I think Jesus in Matthew gives us a little bit more clarity on this issue as well. In Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Jesus says, So when you are offering a gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. So Jesus is not saying not to bring the gift, right? At the end of the story, Jesus is like, bring the gift to the altar, please, you know? But he wants your heart to be right when you're doing that. And uh, that idea of your religious activity being coupled with a lifestyle that's loving the most vulnerable among us is what Jesus and Isaiah are getting at here. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this word that Isaiah brought to the people of Judah and Jerusalem in the 8th century? So I don't think it's fair to try to do a one-to-one comparison. Showing up to church on Sunday morning is not the same thing as offering your first fruits or bringing two doves to be offered as a sacrifice. It's just not the same thing. Because whenever we come to church, we learn more about the character of God, which can help us live out that love for the vulnerable, right? And some of the ways that we help around church, say VBS, which was a great time. I hope you all got to experience VBS. Is a way that we can care for others and show God's love. But God doesn't want us just to come to church to check a box. God wants us to take what we learned here and bring it out to the rest of our lives and let our hearts be changed. It's not about doing the religious activities. It is about letting your heart be changed for those who are vulnerable around you and to live in this moral way, loving your neighbor as yourself. So other ways that we can do this, right, let our hearts be changed. The Bible says that if you read the Bible, it never comes back void. This is another great way to let our hearts be changed. So this is what Isaiah 
is saying to the people of Judah, don't bring your sacrifices without having a lifestyle of love. And I think that is what Isaiah can teach to us today. Don't leave church and leave behind the heart of God. Let the heart of God's love for you change your heart so you can love others better outside of these four walls. That's what Isaiah has to say to us today. Let us pray. Lord, let us be people that love. God, change our hearts. Let this church be a place where we're taught to love. God, thank you for the love that is already in this place, and let it grow. Amen.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> dear, dear Lord, you are a God of justice. Thank you, Lord, for remaining faithful to your promises always and to us personally. Oh, Lord, how we can fall short of living and giving you glory every day. Your word today reminds us how you love us and to be in right relationship with us and how it is only just that we do so as well with you and with our neighbors. If there is anyone who has their heart stirred up right now, may you bring your peace, God, to them and fill them. May you become greater within them be their good morning, their good afternoon, and their good night. May their offerings be so pleasant before you. Your wonderful, glorious, and everlasting God, you are. And as you have guided us in praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Can't see past myself, Lord help me. 
You may be seated. So today, for your discipleship opportunities, we are having a lunch after next Sunday where we are packing hygiene kits for the victims of the Kentucky flooding. So Pastor Laura sent out an email, I think it was yesterday, I got it yesterday, um, that has a sign up genius for the items that we need so before you go out and buy anything check on there to see if it's already purchased there will be tables um, on the i don't know the left side of the fellowship hall if you're looking out the big window and that's where you can place your items but come on out to the lunch after church on sunday next sunday august 14th um, we're also low-key celebrating Sydney and I's last day, so if you want to hang out with us one more time, we'll be there. Don't give me a thumbs down, Kara. We'll come back and visit. But yeah, those are our discipleship opportunities for today. Please stand for our last hymn. Lord, on this day, in remembering the Israelites' many offerings and sacrifices made to give you glory, we give you wholeheartedly our tithes and offerings. May you bless the offering and use it toward your kingdom, growth, and nourishment. And may you provide for those who may be struggling today. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
I invite you to hold out your hands for this moment of sending. Lord, send us out as people who go and love. Love those around us, love the vulnerable, and seek justice. Go in grace and peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.